Let's pray. Father God, though trials come on every hand, Lord, we feel, we still feel like going on. So in the name of Jesus today, through the intercession of the Holy Ghost, speak, O God, today. And those who are watching, I pray that God, the same power that I'm sensing right now in this pulpit, that God, they would sense wherever they are. That they would feel strength to press on. That they would feel your power, God, to carry on because we feel like going on. So I pray that you would bless this word this day. Forgive us of our sins, we pray. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. And amen. Thank you to the praise team for their ministry and song today. As we now get into the Word of God, if you have your Bibles, take them with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We're going to read today from the King James Version of the Bible. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. Daniel 3, 16, 17, and 18, I'm reading and you're hearing the word of God says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, he's able, hallelujah, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace verse 18 but if not but if not be it known unto thee O king that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou has set up today I want to take this text and I want to challenge you with the message today you must take a stand you must take a stand. We thought with the election of Barack Obama as the first president of the United States that we had entered a post-racial age, that Jim Crow was over, that the segregated South was done, that racism was behind us. But that was our problem, we thought. We then thought that after the senseless killings of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald, Alton Sterling, and Philando Castile, that overt racism was surely over. But that was our problem, we thought. Then Ahmaud Arbery was shot while jogging. Breonna Taylor was shot while sleeping. And George Floyd had a knee to his neck. And so we started marching. We started talking. We started peacefully protesting. And we thought that the message was getting across, that people of color were being unjustly targeted, marginalized, and killed. But that was our problem. We thought. And so this week, here we go again. Jacob Blake is at a party in Kenosha, Wisconsin. There's a domestic disturbance at the party. The police are called. When the police arrive, Jacob Blake goes to his car. He's unarmed. His three children are waiting for him in the car, ready to go home. A police officer follows him. Jacob Blake is getting in his car. The police officer grabs him by his shirt. And then he shoots him not once, not twice, but seven times in his back. His children witness and watch all of this. 
Jacob Blake is now in the hospital, paralyzed from the waist down and up until yesterday. He was cuffed to his hospital bed. Imagine that. You've been shot seven times. You're paralyzed from the waist down, but yet you're cuffed to a hospital bed. Now, let me be clear today. I'm not here to say that Jacob Blake was a perfect man. I'm not here to say that he had never done anything wrong. But what I am here to say is I'm here to take a stand against what was done to him because it was wrong. But the police department is trying to say that because he had a knife in his car, a knife they didn't know he had, by the way, until he told them, they're trying to use that as license for shooting him seven times in the back, and he's just trying to get in his car. But yet, it's ironic that that same police department didn't feel threatened when Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17-year-old from another state, with a Smith and Wesson AR rifle style, was run AR-15 rifle style, was running towards them, rifle in hand, after killing two people, wounding another, claiming he was there to restore order and to protect physical property. But yet he crossed back into the state of Illinois because he was allowed to leave while in the presence of police. And then he wasn't taken into police custody for another 12 hours when he turned himself in. But in the name of Jesus, he was wrong for killing those two people. The police were wrong for shooting Jacob Blake seven times. And friends of mine, it's time to take a stand against wrong. Now, there are some people who don't want me to preach this. There are some people who want me to be quiet. There are some people who have called me everything but a child of the Most High God. And I know after this sermon, I'm going to get more letters. I'm going to get more emails. Pastors shouldn't protest. Pastors shouldn't march. Pastors shouldn't speak against racism. Pastors should just be quiet and pray. Yes, I'm going to pray. But I can't be quiet. I won't stop marching. I won't stop peacefully protesting. I won't stop speaking up and speaking out. I don't care if the organized church says I must stop. I answer to a higher authority. I've got God on my side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? No weapon formed against us is going to prosper. God told me to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with him. God is on my side. But not only that, I've got the spirit of prophecy on my side. Again, Ellen White said in this manuscript release, volume 11, page 229, I was confirmed, she said, in all I had stated in Minneapolis that a reformation must go through the churches. Reforms must be made for spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who have been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. So while we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace, Ellen White said, we will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry. So I must take a stand. You must take a stand. 400 years ago, we were beaten on our backs. And 400 years later, we're being shot in our backs. We must take a stand. And I'm drawing a line in the sand. Enough is enough but within the faith community some people within our community feel that if it doesn't affect us directly we can be silent but we can't be silent if someone does something to someone else it's just a matter of time before they do it to you Jesus said, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It was Dr. Martin Luther King who said, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Racism is wrong. Racism is sin. And it's time for the people of God to take a stand against sin. I don't understand some church folk. I don't understand the so-called people of the good book. The so-called saints who can sit idly by and not say anything. 
But then more than that, I don't understand the saints who speak out against those who speak out against racism. But praise God this week for the NBA players. Praise God for the WNBA. Praise God for the NHL. Praise God for Major League Baseball. Praise God for Major League Soccer. At least they were willing to take a stand. LeBron James spoke. Doc Rivers spoke. Kenny Smith walked off the TNT set. They said, we must make and take a stand. Basketball was canceled, not because of COVID-19. Basketball was canceled because of racism. And today, this cleric, this preacher, I want to know, can the church take a stand? A stand against racism, a stand against injustice, a stand against police brutality, a stand against white supremacy. Let me tell you something. Every person, whether black or white, rich or poor, male or female, young or old, educated or uneducated, church member or non-church member ought to stand for something. Every person ought to live for something and possess some basic principles, some basic beliefs and convictions that he or she is willing to die for. The trouble with too many of us is we're too fickle or too afraid to commit ourselves too much to any one cause or course of action. Rather than commit ourselves to something uh, that we are willing to back our lives, our jobs, or other symbols of human security, we'd rather play it safe with indecision where we don't make any choices but we allow others to make choices for us. We'd rather play it safe with popularity, where having spe people speak well of you means more than the integrity of your convictions. Or play it safe with convenience, where we advocate a cause as long as it doesn't cost us anything. Or play it safe with two-facedness, where you will say th one thing in my face, but say another thing in somebody else's face. But nobody respects a person who talks out of both sides of their mouth or tries to stand on both sides of the fence. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you going to serve. But as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. Elijah said on Mount Carmel, how long ye halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then follow him. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, and so you must take a stand. Our text teaches us that there are three Hebrew boys who decided to take a stand against the edicts of the king, but they found themselves as a result in a fiery furnace. We're familiar with this story, but sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. And because of this familiarity, it often makes us become silent or forget the power of this story. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, decides that he's going to build a golden image of himself that's 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And when the Babylonian orchestra was to begin to play music, everyone was to fall down and worship this image. But the Bible says there are three church boys. They are known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refuse to bow down. And when they don't bow down, Daniel 3 verse 12 says that some of the king's subjects run to the king and tell him, O oh, king, you're a great king. You're the greatest king ever. You've done wonderful things. And you made a simple request that at the playing of music, everybody was to bow down and worship the golden image that you set up. Well, those three boys, those three boys that you set over the affairs of Babylon, those three boys that you passed over some of us for, those three boys you promoted before us, those three boys that you're always bragging about, those three boys that you're always looking out for, well, those three boys didn't bow down to your image. Let me pause right here and let me say something. There will always be some people who will make it their business to run to the king. On our jobs, in our communities, in our churches, there are always some who consider it their personal mission to be that of reporting to the king on their other brothers and sisters who are in captivity just like them. During slavery times, one of the greatest obstacles to the freedom of blacks would be those who would run to the king in an effort to show their loyalty when in reality all they were doing was showing their cowardice and the fact that they couldn't be trusted. In fact, 
during the period of slavery, history says that there were over 300 rebellions, over 300 insurrections, over 300 revolts in North America by enslaved Africans who wanted to be free. Some of the well-known, most well-known were by Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner. But in all these slave revolts, who were led, by the way, by black Christian preachers, the revolts were stopped or their strategies never executed because at the last minute, somebody went and ran back to the king and told him the plan. Too often, our allegiance is to the oppressor and not the oppressed. And we end up hurting the very one who's trying to help us rather than the system that's keeping us oppressed. Remember, I had to tell somebody at one of our peaceful demonstrations here in Huntsville who was questioning why we were there. I had to say, look, we're not here because of something we've done. We're here because of something that's been done to us. We're not trying to start a race war. We're trying to end it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People write me letters and sending me emails. Folk, I'm trying to help you. But I'm learning you can't convince something someone of something they don't want to see. That old familiar cliche is true. The people you help the most appreciate it the least. I was reading Dr. Asa Hilliard, a renowned black psychologist in his book, The Black Maroon, and he explained this reality of the oppressed hurting their fellow oppressed instead of hurting the system of oppression with an illustration of the making of a sheepdog. He said, at birth, they take a sheepdog a German Shepherd, a Collie, whatever kind of dog you want, and they take that sheep dog away from its litter, the litter it was born into, and put it in sheep litter so that it will suck the breasts of a sheep. Here's the reasoning. Get the sheep's milk into the dog system. Get the sheep's DNA into the dog system. Let the dog grow up with that sheep litter. Let the dog play with that sheep litter. Let it become just like that litter. And when that dog gets grown, if another dog from its original litter comes near the sheep, the dog that's been raised with the sheep will attack the dog from its original litter. If the master comes near threateningly, the dog will kill its own master to protect the sheep. And likewise, if you take some black people at birth away from their own people and feed them at the breasts of white privilege and white supremacy and let them get that DNA deep down inside of them, when their own people try to tell them what time it is, what affirmative action is, what equal employment is, what racial profiling is, what racism is, they will attack their own people defending the very ones who are keeping them oppressed. I wish I had a witness in this place. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't feed from the breasts of Babylon. So when Nebuchadnezzar heard of their refusal to bow to the image, he flies into a rage and orders them to appear before him. Let that be a lesson for us. Whenever we take a stand, whenever we stand for the right, whenever we have to oppose important people, kings, queens, presidents, politicians, leaders, and even church pillars, sometimes we must be prepared to lay our futures on the line, our lives on the line for what we believe. So Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 14, Is it true, Shadrach? Is it true, Meshach? Is it true, Abednego, that you will not bow down and worship my golden image? Is it true? In other words, the word on the street is that the three of you you have defied my decree. Now, let me help you here, Nebuchadnezzar says. Don't you know that I'm the one who promoted you from nothings to noblemen, from the lower class to the upper class? I changed your name. I opened doors for you. I know you don't want to cross me, so let me tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to give you one more chance. Let's just say you didn't hear the music. Let's just say you weren't paying attention. Let's just say you didn't fully understand. You're from another country, and that's why you didn't bow down, because you didn't understand what was going on, because if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. But then in verse 16, our text, one of my favorite texts of Scripture, they give their response. Let me read it to you in verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Stop right there. In other words, we're not scared of you. 
In other words, we're not intimidated by you. We've talked it over. We put a motion on the floor, and the vote was unanimous. We ain't bowing. This doesn't take a lot of thoughts. This doesn't require a lot of discussion. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, we're not going to bow. Yes, we should be obligated to you. Yes, we should be accountable to you. Yes, we should be indebted to you. Yes, we should be loyal to you. Yes, you've elevated us. We appreciate what you've done, but we've got a different perspective. For every time you opened the door for us, we said thank you, but we praise God. Every level you elevated us to, we say thank you, but we praise God. Every rank you promoted us to, we say thank you, but we praise God. Everything you've given us, we say thank you, but we praise God. In fact, King, we can't worship you. You were just a courier. You were just a conduit. You were just a channel through which God sent our blessing. We can't worship you any more than we can worship a tree for giving us shade, a cow for giving us milk, a bee for giving us honey, rain for giving us water. We thank you, but you're not worthy of our praise. God and God alone is worthy of our praise. We might love you, but we're not going to worship you. We might respect you, but we're not going to worship you. We might honor you, but we're not going to worship you. So Nebuchadnezzar says, look, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. But I love verse 17. Look at it. It says, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able. Now, if I had people in the church, I would say, say able. So at home, say able. Able to deliver us from the burning fire and furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. In other words, throw us into the furnace. And that's okay, because King, we serve a God who's able, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. Let me put a kickstand right there. And let me say this. I'm convinced that most of us don't really believe God is able. Because if we did, we wouldn't spend so much time worrying if we believed God was able. We'd spend less time telling people off, getting people told, setting folks straight if we believe that God is able. We wouldn't give up on a doctor's diagnosis so quick and really give up and believe that God is able to work miracles if we believe that he was able. We, wouldn't spend, we would spend less time giving up on our marriages, giving up on our children, giving up on ourselves, giving up on ourselves if we believe that we serve a God who's able to do exceeding, abundantly, and above all we can ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, but in the name of Jesus. Let me remind somebody that I serve a God and the God I serve is able but then verse 18 but if not hallelujah I shout right there but if not the text says be it known unto the O king we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up in other words we know God can save us but if not we know God can free us, but if not, we know that God can rescue us, but if not, we know that God can give us a job, but if not, we know that God can heal us, but if not, we know that God can stop the cancer, but if not, we know that God can slow the coronavirus, but if not, we know that God can break that habit, but if not, we still won't worship thee. We're going to worship the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham and Isaac, the God of Jacob and Joseph, the God of Miriam and Moses, the God of Enoch and Elijah, the God of Rachel and Rebecca, the God of my mama and my daddy, the God of you and me, the God of heaven. As a child of God, you got to get to the point in your faith where you say that even if God doesn't, even if I lose my job, even if I lose my house, even if I lose my car, even if I lose my, my friends, even if my family doesn't understand, I may have to stand alone. But God is still able because it's not a matter if God can, but it's I know that God will. But if not, 
I'm still not bowing down. Let me tell you something. I speak in the name of Jesus under the unction of the Holy Ghost. No matter what you may be facing today, Carlton Bird is a witness that God is bigger than the stuff you face, bigger than your problems, bigger than your circumstances, bigger than your situations, bigger than your fears, bigger than your troubles, bigger than you because he's God and he's been God longer than you've been you. Just as David and Goliath asked Noah about an ark and a flood, asked Samson about blinded eyes and a temple filled with Philistines, asked Moses about a red sea, asked Joshua about Jericho's walls, asked Joseph about the pit, the prison, and the palace, asked Mary about a virgin having children, ask a dying thief about a saving Lord. If you don't get anything else, get this today. My God is able. Nebuchadnezzar is mad, so he commands the fiery furnace to be heated seven times hotter than its normal heat. In fact, the Bible says in verse 22 of Daniel chapter 3 that because the furnace was much hotter than usual, that the very ones who threw the three boy Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace were killed by the flames of the furnace. Let me stop right here because that's a lesson for somebody. Be careful about fueling the flames for somebody else because the same flames will reach out and grab you. I wish I had a witness in this place. Too many of us are so busy setting traps for others, waiting for other folk to fall, and the same traps we set for others are the same traps we fall in ourselves. You can be so busy turning somebody against somebody else. You better be careful these same folk don't turn on you. The lies we spread on others, the gossip we spread on others, the dirt we do to others will come back and get us. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be ye sure your sins will find you out. Nebuchadnezzar turns the heat up seven times. But why does he do this? Ellen White says that Nebuchadnezzar felt it required more than ordinary power to deal with these noble men. Nebuchadnezzar's mind, she says, was so strongly impressed that something unusual would interpose on their behalf. So he intensified the heat and his strongest men were ordered to deal with him. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar sensed that something might happen to come to the aid of the three Hebrew boys. My question for you today simply is this, family. How come the enemies of God know the power of God and we, the people of God, act like we don't know the power of God? Don't you ever forget that the devil is no match for our God. Put God on the front line of your life and watch God win. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar threw the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. But before we get excited, before we shout, before we stomp, before we clap our hands over the deliverance of God for the three Hebrew boys, let's take an important look at verse 23. Because in verse 23, when you read it, it tells us that the Bible says that the three Hebrew boys fell to the ground in the fiery furnace. Look at verse number 23. The Bible is very clear. It says, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. Now, one would think that if they fell to the ground, they were on their way to sure death. But somebody knows that man's extremity is God's opportunity. Somebody knows that our setbacks are just setups for comebacks. And when it seems like you're going to fall, that's when Jesus stands up for you. It seemed as if the three Hebrew boys were going to fall. But all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar says, hold up, wait a minute. I thought we had three boys in the fiery furnace. His subjects, we did. I thought we heated the furnace seven times hotter. His subjects, we did. Well, why do I see four men loose walking in the fire and the fourth has the appearance of the Son of God? Why? Because when Jesus shows up, Jesus shows out. And when you take a stand for what is right, Yes, you might get thrown into the fiery furnace, but know that Jesus will show up, Jesus will show out, Jesus will stand with you, and Jesus will deliver you. We must take a stand. I said, we must take a stand. A man who 
who stands for anything, for, for nothing, will fall for anything. Why are we so afraid to take a stand? Why are we so afraid to stand against injustice, oppression, and racism? We're supposed to be Christians, followers of right, followers of Christ, examples of faith, haters of wrong, lovers of right. And so today, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. That church member who sits idly by and lets evil persist, I'm calling you out. That Christian who stays quiet because they don't want to rock the boat, I'm calling you out. Christians who know what's right, no racism is wrong, but won't speak against it, I'm calling you out. Those who sit behind desks and just write statements, but won't get their hands dirty and get out on the front lines fighting injustice, brutality, oppression, poverty, and racism, I'm calling you out. The seven-day Adventists who thinks it's okay to be quiet in times like these, or the Seventh-day Adventist who wants to criticize the fight against injustice by trying to provide a history lesson on the origins of the Black Lives Matter movement when those of us who are out here fighting aren't thinking about advocating or following the philosophical, metaphysical, or theoretical beliefs of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, but we're just simply saying Black Lives Matter and the continued disparagement, denigration, and disrespect of black people must stop. I'm calling you out. The person who's making excuses for not participating in promoting Jesus' model in Genesis chapter 1, 26, that all of us are created image and we're made equally in the image of God. I'm calling you out. The pro-lifer who thinks it's just about being pro-life only when the child is in the womb but doesn't care about that same child after it comes out of the womb. I'm calling you out. The one who thinks that 180,000 people dying from the coronavirus is not a big deal when someone has lost their mother, their father, their sister, their brother, their son, their daughter. I'm calling you out. I'm clear. Some are going to say I'm a racist. Some are going to say I spew hate. Some are going to say I'm trying to divide the church. Some will say I've lost my mind. Some are going to write me letters. Some are going to email me. Some are going to try and stymie my career. Some are going to try to misrepresent my true intentions. Some are going to try to flat out lie on me. Some are going to try to say all manner of evil against me falsely. Some are going to even try to make up stuff on me. Some are going to try to do whatever they can to shut me up. But I won't be silent. I won't be quiet. When police brutality stops, when racial supremacy stops, when overt and covert attempts to restrict people from their duly appointed right to the voting booth stops, then I'll stop. But until then, I won't stop. I won't be quiet. I won't shut up. I'm not a racist. I'm not the one trying to divide the church. I'm not the one who financed Osama bin Laden. I'm not the one who allowed drugs to flow through Afghanistan. I'm not the one who put Nelson Mandela in prison for 27 years. I'm not the one who ignored hundreds of thousands of blacks who were killed in Rwanda. I'm not the one who conjured up the Tuskegee experiment to kill hundreds of black men, injecting them with syphilis. I'm not the one who passed Jim Crow laws, segregation laws, or apartheid laws. I'm not the one who beat John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge simply because he wanted black people to have the right to vote. I'm not the one who assassinated Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, or Medgar Evers. I'm not the one who beat Rodney King to death and then got acquitted of the charges. I'm not one, the one who killed the nine people in that Charleston church, Mother Emanuel, while they were having prayer meeting. I'm not the one who killed Ahmaud Arbery while jogging, Breonna Taylor while sleeping. I'm not the one who put a knee to George Floyd's neck. I'm not the one who shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back while he's trying to get in his car. I'm not the one who's trying to end Obamacare, which will leave 23 million Americans without health coverage and make it harder for sick people to get new health coverage at a time when the coronavirus is disproportionately impacting black and Latino Americans. I'm not the one 
who's trying to create a bureaucratic bottleneck prohibiting the removal of Confederate monuments in downtown squares, claiming the problem is money. But then when we raise the money, the monument's still there. I'm not the one who fired rubber bullets at people who were simply trying to exercise their right to peacefully protest in downtown city squares. I'm not the one who said at the turn of the 20th century that black people couldn't eat in the General Conference cafeteria. I'm not the one who capped the number of delegates to the General Conference session when the number of members of color was getting larger than the number of members who were not of color, claiming it was too expensive to have the number of delegates who represented the increased number of church members. I'm not the one. I'm not the one who changed the North American Division Capital Reversion Program, which reduced the number of dollars that would go to regional conferences because of their lower per capita income in comparison to their state conference counterparts. I'm not the one. I'm not the racist. Like the three Hebrew boys, I'm just trying to take a stand. And I'm challenging you to take a stand. This is not about black versus white. This is about right versus wrong. Racism is wrong. Shooting a man while jogging is wrong. Shooting a woman while sleeping is wrong. Shooting a man in the back seven times is wrong. Putting a knee to somebody's neck for almost nine minutes is wrong. You must take a stand. I must take a stand. And my model, my example, my standard is Jesus. He took a stand. He was born in Bethlehem. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, smuggled into Africa, reared in Nazareth, baptized in the muddy Jordan, misunderstood by his family, put out of the organized church, arrested in Gethsemane, beaten by an angry, vicious mob, condemned by the government, crucified on Calvary, wounded in his side, died on a cross, put in a tomb, but he was resurrected from the grave ascended back to heaven and because I'm standing because you're standing one day he's coming to get us when we're standing and I'm going to stand you must stand because if we don't stand the church will be eradicated the community will be devastated the school will be dominated the world will be disintegrated our children will be debilitated the race will be exterminated and the gold globe will be annihilated you must stand because if we can't stand in the fiery furnaces today then how are we going to stand in the fiery furnaces of tomorrow how are we going to stand in the time of trouble how are we going to stand when the world is on fire so today I'm going to stand because I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord I've got my war clothes on in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. It's time to take a stand. You must take a stand. Don't be afraid to stand because when you stand, Jesus will stand with you in the fiery furnace and he will protect you. He will deliver you. He will stand with you. The greatest one of the world is the one of men and women who will stand. The one of men and women who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Men and women who will stand true to duty as the needle is to the pole. I ain't got time to play church. I ain't got time to play Christianity with folks. Folks talking about they loving Jesus, but they don't love their fellow man. I ain't got time for that. Surely, if the sports world can stand, the church should be able to stand as a collective body. We must stand. But not just the church collectively, but each and every one of us individually. God has called us to stand. Now, everybody can't preach. Everybody can't teach. Everybody can't march. But everybody can do something. And it's time for us to stand. Somebody today, it's time for you to stand against your personal demons. 
It's time for you to stand against those habits, those addictions that seem to weigh you down. It's time for you to say, devil, this far and no further. I'm putting my trust in God. I might be in a fiery furnace, but I believe that my God is going to deliver me. He's going to show up in that furnace. He's going to show out in that furnace. He's going to stand with me. He's going to protect me, and he's going to deliver me. So that's my appeal today. Collectively as a church, we got to stand. We got to stand against injustice. Then individually, we got to stand against injustice and oppression. But also individually, it's time for the people of God to take a stand against sin. And Jesus loves you so much, regardless if you sinned last night, last week, last month, last year. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. All he wants you to do today is stand. So today I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, I'm going to pause in my prayer because I'm going to give you the opportunity to stand. Stand as a church, stand as an individual against uh, uh, racism and injustice, and then stand as an individual saying, I'm standing against sin and I need Jesus to save me. Father God, right now, it's time for us to take a stand. And so as a church, oh God, we've got to take a stand collectively. Not worry about what's popular because we can't be popular and prophetic at the same time. Help us to see through the lens of our fellow brother and our fellow sister. Oh God, I pray right now as a church, we take a stand. Because I believe that God, when this, your church takes a stand, you're going to open up the windows of heaven and you're going to pour us out a blessing that there will never be room enough to receive it. So God, help us as a church to stand. But then as individuals, God, may we stand. Stand against racism and bigotry and oppression. But then God, number three, there's someone today who needs to stand against sin. Racism is sin, but Lord, I'm talking about the sin that's right now in their life. The sin that so easily besets them. I don't know what it is. Drinking, drugging, clubbing, fornicating. God, I don't know what it is. Gossiping, I don't know what it is, but in the name of Jesus... God, all of us, we got to take a stand right now against sin. And God, somebody's troubled, somebody's going through it. They're in a furnace and it's burning fire. But God, may we take the stand. And God, by our taking the stand, may we be comforted by the fact that, Lord, you will protect us, that you will keep us, that you will deliver us. But then, God, if not, if you choose not to, we're still going to bless your name. We're still going to praise your name. We're still going to serve you because serving the Lord is going to pay off after a while. So, Lord, I'm getting ready to end this prayer, but I beg of forgiveness of sin right now. And I want to pause in this prayer right now to allow that man, that woman, that boy, that girl right now who needs to take a stand. They're in a fiery furnace right now, or they might be on their way into a furnace, but, God, they got to stand knowing you will deliver. But if not, God, they're still going to worship you. They're still going to praise you. So we pause right now. And I want you right now, those of you who are watching, those of you who are listening, I want you to go to the website of the Oakwood University Church, www.oucsda.org forward slash connect hyphen card. And I, I want you to go to the homepage of the website and, and there's a place where you can connect with God right now. And you want to say, God, I'm taking a stand, a stand against oppression collectively and individually. But not only that, Lord, I want to take a stand against sin, sin in my life. So I need baptism. I need rebaptism because I'm taking a stand. I need Bible study. I need special prayer. I need deliverance because I need to take a stand today. So that's you. I want you to go to that website. I want you to click baptism. Click rebaptism. The devil doesn't want you to stand. The devil doesn't want you to grow. The devil doesn't want you to progress. The devil continues to want you to wallow in sin and discouragement. The devil still wants you to wallow in mess. The devil still wants you to follow the crowd instead of following Jesus. The devil still wants to get in your ear and say, oh, that's a bunch of talk. He's just saying that. No, 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 no. God is trying to speak to you right now. And he wants you to stand. Baptism, rebaptism, special prayer, rededication of your life. Whatever it is, today God wants you to stand. Father, we continue with this prayer. Your people, Lord, have indicated their desire to stand. So God, bless us collectively, bless us individually, that we might stand for the right. For one day, Lord, when you are soon seen coming in the clouds of glory, black people, white people, red people, yellow people, all people, your people, 
those who have died in you will rise first and the rest of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet you and you'll say well done for standing so God I pray that we would stand today seal the decisions that have been made for you trouble the hearts of those who have yet to make a decision for me we give you praise we give you honor we give you glory we worship you God in the beauty of your holiness today and we must take a stand it's this we ask and this we pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray today amen today you must take a stand you can get mad with me all you want you can love me all you want but at the end of the day you must take a stand a stand against wrong and a stand for what is right I'm not perfect. I'm far from that. Please, in fact, be patient with me because God is not through with me yet. But this I do know. I'm going to take a stand for Jesus Christ. That I do know. Because I do believe what I preach, that serving the Lord will pay off after a while. I do believe that God has promised me three, four, and ten. God has promised that if I just live for him because he's already died for me, he says, if you just live for me, one day soon you will live forever with me. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to stand.